Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world. Today, it's exciting to be engaging with one of the foremost experts on business and human rights. Today, we'll be looking at the UN Forum on Business and Human Rights, Protect, Respect and Remedy for All. Thank you so much, Surya Deva, for taking time, not only from your busy teaching schedule, but also coordinating right now the second annual Forum on Business and Human Rights in the Pacific. Thank you, thank you, Joshua. It's my pleasure to be on the show. It is such an honor to have someone with your experience, but also your dedication to the issue. I've been able to fortunately see that over many years. And really, we're also celebrating the 10th year of the guiding principles. Could you maybe share with the world what are the guiding principles and why are they so important in the field of human rights? Uh, definitely. So the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights were adopted uh, unanimously by the Human Rights Council in June 2011. Uh, they were developed by late Professor John Draghi uh, during his six years of mandate 2005-2011. And, and these guiding principles are international soft standards, which uh, basically tell what states needs to do what uh, private sector uh, businesses need to do in, in terms of respecting human rights and remediating adverse impacts. So the guiding principles are built around three pillars and that's where it comes to protect, respect and remedy. So states have a duty to protect human rights against uh, their violations by the business enterprises. All business enterprises have a responsibility to respect all human rights. And then both states and businesses have their respective duties and responsibilities to provide remediation if there are adverse impact on human rights. I think the guiding principles are very important because uh, before 2011, it was a very polarized debate in the business and human rights field about soft versus binding rules. And I think the guiding principles provided a pathway that how we can move forward mm -hmm. And I think uh, after uh, the adoption in 2011, in the last 10 years, we have seen significant progress in terms of their adoption, in terms of the uptake uh, by different actors. And I think uh, because of that, they are really highly influential throughout the world. Of course, the implementation remains a challenge, but as a normative standard, they definitely provide a very important yardstick for both the states and businesses and other actors, including investors, uh, to understand what they need to do. Oh, that's really good. And you also brought up uh, John Ruggie and also David Weisbrot. Unfortunately, both of them had just passed, but they did a really good job at planting the seeds to address and include corporations, multinationals, and smaller enterprise and businesses. Because when we look at the history of human rights, there's been a lot said about states' duties and their role as duty bearers. But we also look, especially since it is Thanksgiving here in the US, the role of corporations with the King, with Columbus, there's always been many businesses having impact on indigenous and communities around the world. So this was the first time, as you shared, Ruggi was able to diplomatically bring everything together and codify it in these guiding principles. And as you said, how many principles are there and what are some of the main points people should be aware of on top of these three elements that you shared of protect, respect, and remedy? Uh, there are 31 principles in total. And before I uh, go a little bit uh, into those principles, I think you mentioned Raghi and Professor Weiss brought. I mean, uh, so it's a sad year, I would say, for the business and human rights community because uh, these two uh, legendary figures in the field have unfortunately left us. Uh, but they created definitely uh, and planted seeds. Uh, they created a momentum in different ways. And I think the uh, draft UN norms also created uh, the groundwork, I would say, for the UN guiding principles. And also, I would say, the treaty process that is going on now to negotiate a binding instrument. So I think those are uh, complementary processes, in my view, the soft standards and, and the hardening of those standards. Let me uh, briefly talk about the 31 principles uh, in the UN Guiding Principles. So we have pillar one, which is the state duty to protect human rights. So we have uh, 10 principles here. And basically the expectation is that the government should ensure by taking a number of steps, legal steps, uh, policy measures, uh, rules and regulations, creating incentives, 
to ensure that all business enterprises within their territory and jurisdiction respect human rights. And I think the word jurisdiction here is quite critical in my view because businesses have transnational footprint and it is critical that uh, the home states of these businesses also have an obligation to ensure that those companies respect human rights wherever they operate. Of course, uh, the pillar one has uh, several uh, components. For instance, there is a key role for the, uh, when the state is an economic actor, you should be taking lead, lead by example, as we call it. And that happens when, let us say, public procurement is involved or when we have a state-owned enterprises which are involved in doing some business. And I think then the expectation is they will also respect human rights. Then there's a greater focus also on policy coherence because we would like the trade and investment regimes and the human rights regime to work together. We don't want a situation in which the governments are trying to attract investment and they ignore labor rights and human rights and the climate change now. That's becoming a big issue. Uh, and I think that policy coherence is, is a key component of Pillar 1. When it comes to Pillar 2, Joshua, uh, as you know, uh, it, it talks about the responsibility of all business enterprises to respect all human rights. Now, what is crucial is that this is an independent responsibility of businesses. So irrespective of what the states do and do not do, businesses are expected to respect all human rights at all times wherever they are operating. And this responsibility is over and above the legal obligations that those businesses may have in certain situations. I would say a key contribution of pillar two is this language of human rights due diligence. This is a four step process and businesses are expected to know and show how they respect human rights and the tool that is provided by pillar two of the UN guiding principles is the UN, uh, sorry, the human rights due diligence. Now let me quickly touch upon the pillar three, which is about uh, access to remedy. Now prevention, as all of us know, working in the human rights field is ideal, it is desirable, but prevention is never uh, foolproof. There are always adverse impact on human rights. And then in those particular situations, the individuals and the affected communities should be able to secure access to effective remedy. And in this particular context, uh, the pillar three provides for three broad possibilities of seeking remedies. Uh, judicial mechanism, like the courts. Second is a state-based non-judicial mechanism. These could be national human rights institutions, which are very, very vital. Uh, but we could also have uh, national contact points, which are established uh, by OECD countries. And the third possibility is that there could be some operational level grievance mechanism, like businesses may establish something uh, to provide remediation or international financial institutions like Asia Development Bank or the uh, World Bank's uh, lending arm, they, they can establish those grievance mechanisms. So I think that is in brief, uh, a, a quick summary of uh, what these three uh, pillars of the UN guiding principles entail. Well, that's absolutely vital, especially it's, it's education and awareness raising and also capacity building of the community and the corporation in the country because many people aren't aware of that. And bringing up Weisbrod, I remember being in the UN subcommission and him bringing those issues forward and seeing him advance those for the norms and then being part of Ruggie's consultation process with different indigenous peoples. What was so exciting when they were adopted, as you said, in 2011 was what next. And I remember the negotiations with Scandinavia hosting in the Human Rights Council in that June. And one idea was how then do we advance and build on that important work of Weisbrot and now Ruggi. And the idea was a UN working group on business and human rights and the idea of a UN forum on business and human rights. And it's exciting to see you there representing Asia Pacific and also your experience even being as chair could you share a bit about what the working group is and how those five members operate and then maybe talk about some highlights of your time on the working group? Definitely, uh, that would be my pleasure. So the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights uh, was established in the same year 2011. 
So the working group uh, comprises uh, five members representing different regions of the world. Uh, I represent Asia Pacific, but we have colleagues coming from Africa, Eastern Europe, uh, Western Europe and the other regions and the Latin America. So the uh, primary mandate of the working group is to promote the dissemination and effective implementation of UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And uh, we work together with governments, private sector entities, industry associations, civil society organizations, NHRIs, civil society groups, trade unions, academia, lawyers, almost everyone, because we adopt a collaborative approach. And I think earlier you mentioned about the importance of raising awareness and building capacity. Uh, we cannot underline and highlight the importance of raising awareness and capacity building enough. Because unless companies and government officials know about UN guiding principles, they cannot really implement them. And I think uh, that is what we do. And I, I see this uh, interview as part of that process as well, raising awareness, reaching out to new audiences in different parts of the world. And I think uh, we keep on doing it. You mentioned the UN Forum and like the uh, UN Guiding Principles, the UN Forum also started around the same time. And this year, uh, next week, in fact, uh, we have the 10th UN Forum uh, on Business and Human Rights. Because of the COVID pandemic, which is continuing, the forum will take place virtually for three days from 29th of November to the 1st of December. Uh, but it used to be uh, an in-person event, uh, the largest event uh, on the planet at this point of time, at least uh, on business and human rights, where uh, more than 2000 people will come from more than 130 countries. Uh, but I think the technology uh, during the pandemic has also provided us an opportunity to reach out uh, to the global south in particular, who are not able to travel to Geneva in person. So, so we also see this as an advantage that we are able to uh, bring on board people who are perhaps uh, not as included in the forum uh, structure. Uh, apart from the forum, we also do a number of other activities to promote the mandate. Uh, as you know, we do two country visits in a year. Uh, uh, because of the pandemic, again, there was some uh, disruption to those visits, uh, but I had a chance to visit Italy uh, in, in late September, early October. Uh, and of course, uh, let us see which countries we visit in next year. Uh, we also accept complaints, complaints against governments, complaint against private sector. Uh, if there are allegations that they have not followed the UN guiding principles. And of course, as you know, Joshua, we also release uh, guidance uh, that happens in the form of two reports that we do every year, uh, where we try to unpack the UN guiding principles, different components. And uh, finally, let me briefly talk about uh, my experience of the working group. I joined the working group on the 1st of May, 2016. So, so I'm in my final year of the mandate because as you know, the mandate is three plus three, six years in maximum. So I'll finish uh, at the end of uh, April next year, 2022. For me, the experience has been quite satisfying. Uh, of course, uh, my mandate is not limited to Asia Pacific, but I have pushed uh, the agenda more, I would say, in the Asia Pacific. And one thing uh, which uh, uh, I take a lot of satisfaction is that we started those sub regional approaches in the Asia Pacific. We started with the uh, South Asia Forum, the East Asia Forum was all already going on, led by UNDP, but I created the South Asia Forum in collaboration with UNDP. And as you know, last year we created the specific forum in collaboration with uh, the Office of the High Commission for the Pacific. Uh, and hopefully, let us see if we can pull it off. Uh, the idea is also to do something in the Middle East. So this sub-regional approach uh, is, is very, very vital. In addition to that, I'm also working on uh, drafting uh, an information note on climate change because the UN guiding principles don't mention climate change or environmental rights anywhere. Uh, so, but, but there are deep linkages between human rights and climate change. So how do we draw those connections together? So this information note will provide guidance on that particular aspect. Of course, earlier, uh, I would also like to mention a couple of quickly uh, other reports that I led. One is around the gender aspect. So I think that was the report to the Human Rights Council in 2019, 
Uh, and basically it put uh, the gender dimensions in the center of the business and human rights discourse. Uh, and earlier than that, I did uh, reports around access to remedy. So that was a 27 report uh, on what is an effective remedy. And more recently, I did a report around the role of national human rights institutions in the business and human rights agenda. And of course, uh, my final report, uh, which was to the um, uh, General Assembly, which I presented in uh, last month, in fact, was on international investment agreements. Uh, that how can states bring in human rights, environmental issues, and climate change considerations into their investment agreements. And I think that links nicely with the policy coherence point that I was talking about earlier as part of Pillar 1. So I think that is uh, a quick fire, uh, rapid fire summary of uh, what the working group does and uh, what I have been doing in the last uh, five and a half years as part of the working group. Well, it's an excellent summary and just gives a glimpse into the good work that's being done regarding this very important field. And as you described the forum, and, and it reminded me of being there at the first handful of those. And these are, it is true, there were more different elements of the economy, of the ecology, all people coming together. Former High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson, everyone looking at the important contribution of the guiding principles. And so maybe you could share with us then, what have been some of the innovative initiatives that have taken place since the guiding principles were introduced and some of the ways that the forum has been able to really, those innovative initiatives from the international down to like the islands level to bring those guiding principles alive. Yes. So I would say that uh, the working group uh, just completed a project. Uh, we call it uh, the stock taking report. There are two dimensions to this uh, project. One is to review the progress we have made in the last 10 years in implementing the guiding principles. And the second component is the roadmap ahead, where we should be going in the next 10 years. So I'll invite uh, the uh, audience to look at our website and, and look at those two particular documents uh, which should provide uh, more details. Uh, but let me highlight uh, the positives. What have we achieved in the last 10 years? And I will start with this point that uh, UN guiding principles provide a common language. Everyone, whether these are states or companies or industry associations or trade unions or NHRIs or civil society groups or academia or lawyers or investors for that matter, all of us, can talk to each other in the field of business and human rights through this common language of UN guiding principles on business and human rights. I think this is uh, quite a remarkable achievement to begin with, because uh, if we speak a common language, then it is easier to collaborate because we are talking about the same thing and uh, we are moving in the same direction perhaps. The second, uh, Key contribution is, I would say that uh, UN guiding principles are accepted by almost all stakeholders. And slowly we see the uptake and the adoption of nation action plans on business and human rights in all parts of the world. Earlier in the, in the beginning of the, um, uh, this last decade, most of the nation action plans were from European countries. But in the last couple of years, we have seen progress in Asia. For instance, we have three countries, uh, Japan, Thailand, and Pakistan adopting national action plan. Several other countries like India, uh, also Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, other countries as well, they're working on national action plan on business and human rights. In Africa also, we have uh, Kenya and Uganda adopting national action plans. And of course, in Latin America also, we have uh, uh, Chile and uh, also uh, Mexico adopting National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. So, so I think that is, uh, sorry, sorry, not Mexico, it's, it's Colombia. Uh, my, my apologies for that. So Mexico was uh, in the drafting stage, but I think there are some uh, issues there, but they haven't yet crossed the line. So what, I, what, what I'm trying to suggest here is that uh, in different world regions, uh, we can see uh, definitely a significant progress in terms of the uptake. 
The other aspect that I would like to highlight is the alignment of other standards with UN guiding principles. So whether these are the uh, OECD guidelines, or this is ILO tripartite uh, declaration for MNEs, all these are aligned with the UN guiding principles. And a related, related aspect is that the UN guiding principles are also shaping law and policy. And that is what we call the hardening of soft standards. Especially in Europe, we have those standards coming into the form of uh, mandatory human rights due diligence legislation. And uh, let us see uh, what the draft uh, comes out next year, because the European Commission is set to release a draft of that for, for the entire Europe. And this will have a global implication because this law is going to apply extraterritorially. So any company operating in Europe would have to comply with it. And I think that's how it's going to capture the supply chains in the global south as well. So I think these are, I would say, uh, significant uh, achievements. Uh, at the same time, going forward, there are many things we need to improve. Uh, we, we need to bridge this gap between what uh, governments and companies are saying on paper and what their practice is. We need to definitely improve uh, access to remedy and corporate accountability. Uh, a lot of work needs to be done about that. We also need to uh, strengthen and provide uh, civic space because, as you know, human rights defenders are under attack uh, in almost all world regions. And we can't really think of implementing UN guiding principles effectively unless we have a free civil society and space for human rights defenders to operate. So I think uh, there, there are many more um, challenges that are there. New technologies are also emerging. Climate crisis is, is a big issue. So I think there's a lot more work needs to be done. Uh, but the guiding prin principles provide a pathway. Of course, uh, this is not the end of the world. Uh, in, in terms of the standards, uh, this is merely a floor, not the roof. Uh, but hopefully, we will build more ambitious standards going forward, and we will also implement the UN guiding principles better going forward. And you can definitely see now where the roots are really taking shape for the business and human rights around the world with all those examples. And as you mentioned, climate change, I just returned from Glasgow and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP26. So I know that language that you're drafting will be very valuable to the rest of the world. Maybe you can share when that will be coming out or if there's still a time for people to contribute. And that also could lead into the exciting second forum on business and human rights, which I know you spearheaded and that's now taking place. Could you maybe share a little bit about some of the issues coming out of the national hubs of the second forum on business and human rights and some of the issues you see related to the guiding principles in our region. Yes, of course. Uh, le le let me talk about the climate change information note. Uh, so you mentioned COP26, and there is always this struggle to connect uh, human rights and the climate change agenda. And you can see that uh, the struggle continues, including at COP26. So this information note, which I hopefully uh, uh, will finalize by the end of next month, uh, will unpack what UN guiding principles uh, mean for states and private sector and others in terms of uh, climate change. Uh, there's still uh, a small window uh, for uh, stakeholders to get in touch with me if they have any ideas. But this is not a full report. This is just a in short information note, but hopefully in future, there will be more work done around this uh, by the working group. In terms of uh, the second UN Pacific Forum on Business and Human Rights, as I mentioned to you uh, earlier, uh, this is part of the working group's uh, regional or sub-regional strategy to push the agenda in different parts of the world. Because the local context is very, very crucial. And if we don't take into account the local political, social, economic, and cultural context, it is difficult to implement the UN guiding principles. Let us take Indonesia. Indonesia has more than 10,000 islands. So implementing UN guiding principles in Indonesia is very different how it would look like in a country like US, which is a very vast country with, with 50 states. Uh, but it is not like uh, the, the small island of Indonesia. Or let us talk about Mongolia. 
where people move around in the same country, right? So I think those local contexts are very, very relevant. Or we can talk about the Solomon Islands. Again, about um, uh, around 1,000 islands, uh, but they face uh, quite serious crisis coming from the climate change, uh, right? So I think that local context is very much relevant and we're keeping that in mind. We started this forum in collaboration with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, but before that, we built the background. Uh, and Joshua, you were part of some of those workshops that we did uh, with the Diplomacy Training Program and the Office of the High Commissioner. We, do those, we did those workshops in uh, Fiji and in PNG. And now we have been doing those workshops virtually. So they, they built that background uh, of uh, raising awareness about UN guiding principles and building the capacity around that. And I think that was quite significant uh, a starting point which provided a, a groundwork for the forum. Now the forum is taking place. Uh, so uh, this year uh, we did something innovative. So the forum is started on Monday, 22nd of November. Today is the final day uh, of the forum. And on the first day, it was a private, um, uh, what we call national hubs. National hubs were not public hubs, but these were the hubs that we created in different countries. And we wanted to put the rights holders in the Pacific countries at the center of the forum. So we could pull off uh, these national hubs uh, in four countries, uh, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, uh, Fiji, and PNG. Uh, in PNG, I think it was entirely virtual, but it was also hybrid in other places. And then we uh, allowed some sharing from those four hubs to take place uh, on the first formal day of the forum yesterday. And the people are engaging in those particular issues, whether this is about uh, illegal logging, land grabbing, uh, environmental pollution issues, climate change, or gender-based violence. All these are very important issues for the Pacific. And I think the guiding principles have a role to play in how we can work together to overcome some of the challenges. No, that was really important and it's exciting to see everything that's being raised, even deep seabed mining. Uh, as we're coming close to the end of the program uh, and we won't be able to see each other together at the Forum on Business and Human Rights, could you maybe give an overview of what will happen in Geneva for that 10th anniversary as we look at this decade of action? And I know you mentioned earlier the treaty that's also emerging. Maybe you could close with some insights to those important international institutions and how they are becoming a reality for businesses and communities around the planet? I think there is, let me start with quickly about the treaty process. I think there is a growing recognition that uh, we should not see any conflict between soft standards and the binding standards. We need both. And the treaty process should be seen in this particular context. Uh, and the working group also issued a statement uh, last month that we see this uh, complementary relationship and to create a global level playing field, the government should work together to create binding rules at the international level. But of course, we need binding rules at the national and regional level as well. So the process is moving ahead, uh, but of course, we need uh, more political support uh, from developed countries to this process uh, so that they can push the agenda together in my view. About the forum, uh, this will be an entirely virtual event uh, taking place uh, over three days, starting on 29th of uh, November to the 1st of December. Uh, there will be a number of sessions uh, covering a range of issues, uh, but a key focus this year is on the 10th year's uh, anniversary of the UN Guiding Principles. Uh, in particular, where we want uh, us to be there in 2030, next 10 years, right? So that is the roadmap. It will be launched on the first day. And then uh, we will try to integrate the roadmap into different sessions uh, throughout the three days. And we very much hope uh, that uh, the real thing is uh, uh, that whatever we say, we try to implement in practice. I think that is, that is crucial, right? And uh, we very much hope that going forward, uh, the continued push about the better implementation of UN guiding principles will continue. And uh, the forum like this in Geneva or the regional forum in the Pacific uh, could definitely be uh, a game changer going forward in my view. Excellent, and that overlaps very well with the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the 17 Global Goals. And it's been an honor to watch you organize and operate in Asia and the Pacific 
to bring these guiding principles from paper into practice. And thank you so much for your two terms on this important aspect. And I want you to know it's also inspired me as we've been accepted into a new cohort here for Travel to Change and Native Hawaiian Hospitality to educate tourism industry about the guiding principles. So we're doing the work here in Hawaii as well. So thank you so Excellent. much for joining us. And I know our time has passed, but I look forward to meet you at the next forum, either in the Pacific or in Geneva. Mahalo. Mahalo. So pleasure meeting you and doing this with you. Uh, take care and see you again sometime.